We have a number of guests here today, uh, uh, too many guests to uh, recognize by name, but uh, Chris Barker, please. Thank you. Good morning, Rotarians and many guests. Um, if, you, if these group of people would just please stand up so we can acknowledge them and welcome them to our group today. Um, if the parents and grandparents and other family members of the speech contestant Contestants would please stand up so we could say thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much. And also, if the teachers from Hudson High School and Western Reserve Academy could please stand. Thank you very much. Is the recorder here? Okay, well thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. So I would let, next like to call upon, we're going to have a little business and then we'll start into our speech contest. I'd like to call upon uh, President-elect Mayor David Basil to present the results of our nominating committee for our officers and board for next year. Dave? Caught in the act, I guess. Um, the nominating committee uh, is presenting a slate of candidates for club positions for next year. Uh, for president-elect, Catherine Sines. <laughs> Secretary, Chris Barker has agreed to continue her great work. And Joe Zapatowski uh, as Assistant Secretary. <laughs> Treasurer, I am pleased to tell you Ben Rexroad has agreed to serve another year and continue his great, great efforts. And Rich Warfield has agreed to be Assistant Treasurer for another year. 
The Board of Directors for terms expiring in 2019. Uh, the three nominees are Gail Royster, Ed Sogan, and George Schmutz. Elect. Elect. <laughs> and your honor mayor. <laughs> I, move, I move that we close the nominations and proceed to a voice vote today. Is there a second? I second. Well, we have multiple seconds, so I guess we've got a second and a third. Uh, all in favor of the motion as presented to close nominations and move to a voice vote this morning. Say aye. 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 All opposed? No one opposed? So, by voice vote, does the club accept the recommendation of the nominating committee for the officers and directors of the club for the coming Rotary year? Say, say I do. Aye. Aye. Great. We're concluded. Thank you, everybody. And, and I just want to extend a personal word of thanks uh, to Catherine uh, for agreeing to be the president-elect for the new officers and for the board of directors. I'm really looking forward to working with everyone, and I think uh, we have tremendous leadership uh, continuing for next year. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, President-elect Dave, and thanks, uh, thanks Gail. Uh, no sense in waiting four weeks to hold elections, uh, like our bylaws uh, request. So let's move right into our program. This is always an exciting uh, program of the year, and I'd like to call on Jim Ahern to get us started. Good morning. Good morning. I don't think the hickory stick would pass the four-way test. <laughs> Not sure about that, but I don't think it would. Uh, this is Ted Olson. I'm Jim Ahern. and. Uh, Ted is from the, uh, the, the Clock Tower Club, and this is a joint effort we're doing together. And um, we'll make a few comments, and I'm going to ask Ted to say a few things about doing it together. But I did want to introduce this uh, and just a little bit of background about uh, this contest and its, its origins. Um, I don't know exactly, I couldn't find out exactly when it started, but I know that uh, my neighbor, Jeff Collier, told me uh, a couple of years ago that when he was 16 years old, he won the Rotary Contest. So I know it's 50 years old. So if you see Jeff, you know how old he is. Um, and it's kind of cool, because it started in 1932. A guy by the name of Herbert Taylor uh, came up with a, a test, a short test for ethics. And he came up with a four-way test. And in, 19, uh, in the early 40s, uh, it was uh, adopted by the, by the Rotary Club. Uh, the speech contest is based on utilizing this four-way test as a way to look at uh, current issues, uh, ideas, and ethical problems that we may be facing. Um, there's about 500,000, supposedly 500,000 business leaders that have the four-way test on their desk, which is, shows why it lasts as long as it has. The process that we're, uh, we have four finalists here. Uh, last week we had the preliminaries, so the, the four folks, two from Western Reserve Academy and two from Hudson that are here uh, were the two top uh, scoring uh, contestants at each of their schools. And the process is going to be simple. As soon as I'm done talking and Ted has a few words to say, um, we'll go through one through four. They'll come up, they'll introduce themselves and talk a little bit about themselves after they're done, not before, so they can start right into their talk. And uh, when they're done, uh, when all four are done, judges will move from the room. Joe's going to do a few more things, and we'll come back and announce the, uh, the results. Ted. Thank you. I just want to take this opportunity to express uh, the thanks that we, the Clock Tower Rotary, have for doing this program with your club. I think this is a great example of what our two Rotary Clubs in Hudson can do together. Nothing is more important than uh, advancing our students as they go forward. And it's also nice to bring Hudson High School and Western Reserve Academy students together as we also do in our Junior Leadership Hudson program. So with that said, let's begin. Good. OK. Uh, number one. Am 
I okay if I just go without this? No, actually, no, no, no. no, no, no. no, no, no. Sorry, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> All right, can you hear me? Perfect. As a child, I never understood why my brother didn't play with me. I never understood why the dog barking made him so upset. I never understood why he couldn't make it through an entire day at school. I never understood why my brother was different. But then I found out my brother Andrew has autism. School didn't work out for him because he was hypersensitive to his surroundings. He was bothered by things that other people wouldn't even notice. Imagine walking into school and the overhead fluorescent lights appearing like strobe lights. Imagine the hum of the PA system sounding like a plane landing. Imagine the chatter of other students escalating into the chaos of a rock concert. It was overwhelming his senses. This didn't just happen to my brother. The one thing that most children with autism have in common is sensory processing disorder, no matter where they lie on the spectrum. It's not just a few kids. 25 years ago, one in 10,000 children had autism. And today, it's one in 68. In schools, when these children aren't given the proper environment to help them cope, it doesn't just affect them, it affects our entire community. Parents, teachers, therapists, school districts are all forced to problem solve with limited tools at their disposal. No disability accommodations exist for children with autism. So I decided to find a solution to this problem. I created a company called The Star Room. The Star Room is built as a sanctuary for the senses using top quality building components to create a sensory neutral environment. The Star Room is the first of its kind to address the entire environment with a design backed by scientific research and autism medical experts. It's therapeutic, eliminates sensory overstimulation, and provides children with a calm, comforting, and safe environment to help them regain their footing. The first Star Room has already been built and two more are on their way in Canton, Ohio. But to consider the merits of the Star Room, let's take it through the rotary four-way test. First, is it the truth? While every child is different, over 90% of children with autism have sensory processing disorder, which is the inability to process information received through the senses. A recent study by Science Daily demonstrates that so social and sensory overstimulation drive autistic behaviors. So if we reduce overstimulation in schools, stress levels decline and learning and behavior greatly improve. Is it beneficial to all concerned? Today, schools have two ways of dealing with a child in distress. The principal's office or a closed room, which is unfortunately more often than not a closet. Neither of these avenues contribute to the emotional well-being of the child or actually help solve the problem of overstimulation. But the Star Room is a place to de-escalate, where children can go to avoid the situations that lead to behavioral issues and return to the classroom ready to learn. Staying in school not only benefits the child, but also the parents, who will worry less and not have to pick their child up from school as much. In schools, teachers benefit from the Star Room because they have a designated place that is happy for the child and non-disruptive to the classroom. Now, teachers, therapists, and even other students will be able to watch for visual cues of escalation and take the child straight to the star room where he or she can calm down. Is it fair to all concerned? Today, there are more than one million children in the United States who have autism. But in the US, there are only 500 specialized autism schools, each with the average enrollment of 50 children. That's 25,000 children out of a million. The average price tag, $100,000 per year. Families with, of children with autism need the public school system. And the Star Room provides a more practical and financially fair solution to the families who don't have the funds to send their child to a specialized school. The Star Room is exactly what these children need for a fraction of the cost at a specialized school. 
Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Because these children are constantly having to leave the classroom, they're not very connected to their peers or teachers. But if an episode could be treated by going to the star room, the child no longer has to leave. Staying in school enables children with autism to grow socially and create better friendships. Parents, teachers, therapists, school districts will be able to build stronger partnerships around the child, which in the end promotes goodwill amongst everyone. In conclusion, I love my brother, and he's the inspiration behind the Star Room. The number of children affected by autism has nearly doubled in the past 15 years. But now, the Star Room offers hope for parents and help for teachers. With the revolutionary method in the building process, we are able to treat the entire environment with the design backed by medical, re medical research and scientific research. The truth is, learning greatly improves when sensory overstimulation is addressed in schools. Benefits include a non-disruptive classroom, emotional well-being of the child, and peace of mind for parents and teachers. It's financially fair, creates better friendships, and promotes goodwill amongst everyone. Thank you. So my name is Paul Schumacher. I'm a junior at Western Reserve Academy. So my next year will be at Western Reserve Academy. And instead of talking about what I'm doing, uh, well, instead of talking about college, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Star Room, tell you about that. So as I said, the first Star Room has already been built, and two more are on their way in Canton, Ohio. And out of, those children, out of that school, there's 300 students at that school. And out of those 300 students, 80 of them will benefit from the Star Room being in their school. Thank you. What was that? Yes, sir. We'll give the judges a minute or two. What did I do? I did it, I think. Okay. Do um, yeah. you need help? Um. I remember the first time I picked up a violin when I was eight years old. At the time, it seemed so awkward and strange to me. I remember wondering, what could this weird shaped carved piece of wood ever do to anyone? But little did I know that this strange piece of carved wood would in fact grow to be such an important part of my life, filling, filling it with more than just music, but with knowledge, joy, and friendship. Now, don't get me wrong. First learning to love the violin was not a simple task. When I began my very first violin piece, Variations on Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, I hated it. The noises that were emitted from my instrument were, let's just say, less than satisfactory. I was horrified by the screeches and squawks that came out of my instrument, and I did absolutely anything to avoid playing. However, by the time fourth grade rolled around and I joined my very first elementary school orchestra, 
My initial hatred for the instrument slowly eroded away as I learned to play music and create beautiful audience music with groups of peers of around 60 people who were just like me. And I learned not only to love music, but I learned about myself and I learned what I enjoyed most. However, public schools across the country are cutting down on arts and music educational programs by an average of 35% or 57 minutes per week. According to the Department of Education statistics, over 2.1 million students and children across the country have limited to no access to arts and music educational opportunities. And by depriving these students and children of the ability to learn about this vital part of their own culture, public schools are in fact also hampering these students from being able to excel academically. In order to reinforce the importance of art and music education in public schools, let us put it to the four-way test. First, is it the truth? According to, according to a study done by the National Endowment for Art, students who take part in arts and music educational programs in their public schools are more likely to excel academically. In fact, students who are engaged in such activities are 10% more likely to attend and complete difficult math courses, such as calculus. In addition, these students averaged a grade point average of 3.17 in comparison to the average 2.97 of the general other population. Therefore, by taking away these music and arts educational opportunities, public schools are in fact hampering their students from being able to excel academically. Second, is it fair to all concerned? Students across the nation who are interested in arts and music careers are unable to achieve these dreams out of no fault of their own, but rather their public high school and middle school curriculums do not give them the opportunity in order to take necessary courses to achieve their dreams. Many prestigious music colleges across the nation require students to take AP Music Theory prior to application. However, according to the 2014 AP program statistics, AP Music Theory was the eighth least administered test across the nation. And by depriving these students of the ability to take important courses that are vital to their success in their own dreams, students are completely unjustified and schools are com being completely unfair to students who are interested in such music and art fields. Third, does it promote goodwill and better friendships? Playing in a musical ensemble is an experience like no other. Rather than playing in a sports team in which you are constantly competing to get ahead of the other competitors, or striving to do better than other opponents, in a musical ensemble, the entire group of people has one common goal, to create the most beautiful music to every single person in the audience. And only in these types of ethereal experiences and amazing common environments are people able to build the strongest friendships and the longest lasting bonds. Finally, is it beneficial to all concerned? The benefits of music and arts programs in public schools are not limited to the students participating in them. In fact, the entire community benefits. Concerts and musical performances held by public schools will be enjoyed by every single member of the community. And benefit concerts held by student musicians can raise money in order to help everyone in need across the world. We as a nation add music to every single venue possible. We add it in order to promote a more harmonious and friendly relationship between everyone in the room. We add music to awards assemblies, sports shows, even hotels and elevators. So given all of these important benefits from music and art, is it really beneficial to our country's educational system to take these important aspects of our culture out of our educational curriculum? 
I know that my first elementary school experience in orchestra was phenomenal. It was impactful in a way like no other, and it shaped who I am today. And that type of impactful, insightful experience is the type of experience that should never be denied to anyone in this country. Thank you. My name is Maria Zhao. I'm a sophomore at Hudson High School, and I play the violin. <laughs> Uh, I'm in my high school orchestra, and I also play in the Cleveland Orchestra Youth Orchestra. It's really fun. All right, thank you. Good morning. The years of road trip books on tape and checking out 50 novels at a time on our mother's library cards are far from the present as teens across America dismissively recall the days when their bedside tables were ruled by the Wizard of Oz and Nancy Drew as opposed to iPhones, iPads, and MacBooks. In grade school, we always had library class and right to read week. Because all the students collectively read 1,000 books, our principal literally launched herself into the sky in a hot air balloon. Of course, we were always given incentives to read, but as kids, literature was just part of the daily schedule. Nights we took home picture books from the Scholastic Book Fair. Mornings we huddled around our teacher on carpet squares to listen to Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. At the middle school in Hudson, the administration has even implemented a half hour at the end of every day for students to do nothing but read. But if we fast forward to high school, there's hardly time for books in the minimal space between homework tests and extracurricular activities. Suddenly, there are only so many hours in a day, most of which don't allow for reading much more than what is assigned in English class. And when analyses and annotations are designated to every chapter, for many students, the anticipation of reading disappears. In its place stands Cliff Notes. This morning, with the help of the Rotary four-way test, I will prove that, in the busyness of their academic and social lives, the vast majority of teenagers completely lose interest in reading. The pieces of the Rotary four-way test are as follows. Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concern? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? And is it beneficial to all concern? Well, to begin with, is it the truth? I have to start by mentioning that every time I go into the library, something seems a little out of place, and this may be that no one is reading in the library. In fact, finding a student with a book in their hands has become a challenge over the years. In a survey of 52 Hudson High School students, exactly half replied that they hardly ever read a book that wasn't assigned in a class. 35% said they'll read a book in their spare time now and then. 52% of students don't consider reading to be one of their hobbies. 70% currently don't have time in their schedule to read. And according to Time Magazine, 45% of American 17-year-olds read a book by choice once or twice per year. So why do numbers like these keep on increasing? And is it fair to all concerned? My concern is that people of all ages, teenagers especially, just don't understand the diverse advantages that come with reading a little bit every day. And this, by all means, is not fair. Reading is one of the best methods to relax and reduce stress. Incidentally, it's also a good way to promote focus, concentration, and self-discipline. Great readers are often great writers and strong analytical thinkers. And in order for students to enjoy skills such as these, it is only fair that they first learn to enjoy reading. This leads to my next question. Will the exercise of teenagers reading build goodwill and better friendships? To quote Oscar Wilde, it is what you read when you don't have to that determines what you will be when you can't help it. 
With every book that we read, we learn about another human struggle, and with it comes the knowledge to grow from the experiences of others. The insight gained through books can be used to understand our peers and reach out to those in need. In literature, we often find the themes and morals that maybe weren't so apparent in the movie adaptation, and goodwill and better friendships result. And finally, will a revival in the interest of reading be beneficial to teenagers? Last weekend, I babysat a little girl who decided to write a book. And when she was finished, even though there were no actual words written down on the page, she recited to me, in an old house in Paris that was covered in vines lived 12 little girls in two straight lines. In two straight lines, they broke their bread and brushed their teeth and went to bed. They left the house at half past nine in two straight lines and rain or shine. The smallest one was Madeline. Sound familiar? Yeah, well, I toyed with the idea of trying to explain to a four-year-old girl what plagiarism was, but I decided against it because her exposure to books proved multiple points. Reading improves our memory and expands our vocabulary. It builds our creativity and innovation and stimulates our minds. There is no hobby more beneficial than reading, and although many things seem to come and go throughout the ages, reading is timeless. Every career requires careful reading, whether this means examining emails and essays, reference books or reports, contracts and constitutions, or treaties and tabloids. Will my generation be prepared for this? Although the good old days of road trip books on tape may lie behind us, it would appear that there is still hope. In that survey of 52 Hudson High School students, 62% said that if they had more free time, they would definitely try to read more. It could be for hours on the beach in the summer, or in the minutes in between classes, or in place of the time you spend on Twitter every day. Reading shapes us as humans and molds our individuality. We find inspiration and understanding in centuries of literature, volumes upon volumes of stories, fulfillment that can't be found in a TV screen or a device. If there are 129,864,880 known titles on the planet, then there is one for you and there is one for every teenager who thinks that they don't like to read, but who knows? With the right book and just a little bit of time every day, the teens of today will experience the best of times, certainly not the worst of times. Thank you. My name is Kate Greer. I'm a senior at Hudson High School. This is my third year doing this contest. Uh, next year, I definitely plan on going to college. Where, I'm not quite sure, but I would like to major in secondary education, German language, and history. So I hope to become some sort of teacher that involves German and history someday. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> <clears throat> this is real, this is me I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be Now I'm gonna let the light shine on me 
The 13-year-old me stands alone on the stage of Korean Idol, her heart still pulsing with pure joy. The three judges in front of me approve of my passion with an immediate yes. And for a young girl, my dream is taking shape. The final online vote will push me to the next round. But my curiosity of strangers' reactions brings with my dream a nightmare. Shortly after my performance is broadcasted, I go online and I see hate. I expected comments on my tone. Did I hit the high notes? Were people touched by the melody? Instead, I learned that I was too stocky, no fashion sense, and so on. Or actually, I did get one positive comment, that I had gained someone's respect for having the courage to show my thick thighs in public. Cyberbullying is then a problem that must be tested with the rotary four-way test. Is it the truth? With the massive population of a generation preoccupied with social media only growing, cyberbullying is equally increasing. According to the Cyberbullying Research Center, at least 34% of teenagers have been victims of cyberbullying, and that percentage is still heading upwards. Cyberbullying especially happens often through comments on visual contents, such as images and videos, making people's appearance the target of criticism. Such criticism extends beyond my thick thighs and sinks to diatribes on race, religion, and sexual orientation. And every single day, a storm of critique on people's appearance recurs, proving that cyberbullying exists. Second, is it fair to all concerned? Cyberbullying is a mutually disrespectful interaction that only erodes equality. Its elimination will be fair to all concerned because bullies and victims are both in need of care and consideration. Let me explain. It is clear that the victims are in need of a rehabilitation from being bombarded with criticism. What many people may not realize is that the bullies are oftentimes a bully themselves. According to studies, less than 0.5% of teenagers are true bullies who have never been bullied before. The majority of the bullies were discovered to have their own issues, such as depression, paranoia, and suicidal behavior. Understanding and solving the problem of cyberbullying is to help the bullies to face their personal problems so they will not feel the need to hate. And by doing so, we will be able to prevent the future victims from suffering. Therefore, the eradication of cyberbullying will be fair to all concerned. Will it build goodwill and better friendships? The thoughtless comments that come from strangers are bound to upset anybody who receives the criticism. The same type of deprecation coming from friends is not any better. But to eliminate the problem of cyberbullying is not simply a matter of eliminating belittlement. It is also a matter of putting ourselves in the bully's shoes, as I previously mentioned. This matter is important because understanding each other's pain will help friends become even closer. You see, the bullies criticize to console themselves because they themselves have been hurt before. Understanding as to why they bully will therefore provide refuge from their hurting situations. Such understanding relationships will bring about civilized goodwill and even friendship between the two unlikely parties as soon as they realize that they are both victims of hate. Lastly, will it be beneficial to all concerned? The effects of cyberbullying are not limited to cyber users. Both cyber victims and non-cyber victims have been targeted for criticism. This means that the victims of the same hate are even more pervasive. Therefore, a wider scope of people, parents, sisters, brothers, friends, who care about the victims are also bound to getting hurt 
as long as the hate exists. We must break the cycle of constant hate by comforting the discomforted victims so they will not feel the need to hate, cutting down the number of future victims. In fact, the eradication of cyberbullying will bring about an open, helpful society that builds trust among people. It will allow for both past victims and perpetrators to show their real selves. They will be confident enough to have honest face-to-face -face dialogues instead of anonymous hate. Simply, yes, the extermination of cyberbullying will be beneficial to all concerned. Now my 13-year-old self thinks these comments are just some meaningless blabber of some unfortunate people in need of help. Oh, and my thighs, they're pretty decent. Thank you. <laughs> I turn off the computer just hoping that those commenters will have a better life. Better enough that they will not feel the need to vent online. Perhaps a decisive law that prevents the initial signs of the hurting cycle will put an end to cyberbullying. A widespread awareness of what is said and how some of those statements may bring out the bully and the victims will also be a seminal step towards putting an end to cyberbullying. Because I understand that the commenters are also humans who are prone to criticism of their own flaws, I do not regret leaving myself open to the public. After all, the 13-year-old me on that stage is a real me. And I am not scared of taking a step towards putting an end to the hate. I understand. Thank you. So, hello again. Um, my name is Jian Kang. I'm from South Korea. I'm a boarder at Western Reserve Academy. Um, I'm currently a junior, although I do look old because I'm 18. Um, <laughs> currently, I don't really have college plans because I'm still a junior, but um, I'm just like a musician at our school. I love being in the musical, so you can definitely come and watch when we had them. Um, I'm the concert master of our orchestra. I'm a prefect because I love talking to people. So yeah, those are just some things about me. Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Well, the judges are doing their tabulations. We'll uh, conduct a little business. And I just wanted to let all the parents and uh, students know our meetings are recorded and, uh, and they'll be shown on Hudson Cable Television. So next week, this meeting here will be shown, I think, five, four or five times, Hudson Cable Television. The first one is Monday at noon, so check, uh, check that out and uh, you may want to uh, watch that. James, oh, there we are. James, I, I do want to mention the, uh, in April, mid-April, April 22nd to 24th, Rockin' the Change, the district conference. This is, uh, I've, I've attended the conference the past couple of years. This is really an interesting conference. It starts, it starts Friday at noon and it ends on Sunday uh, morning. But the nice thing about this conference is that you can go for as many or as little events as you, as you, want, to, uh, as you want to attend. Want to go for Friday lunch, Saturday lunch, uh, but the uh, uh, you can do that and just pay for those events. But the big event, uh, th the main events are Saturday morning when they do a number of seminars and uh, and, and classroom work, uh, learning about Rotary. And the other big event is Saturday evening when there is really is a gala dinner with some interesting speakers and entertainment. So, Rotarians and their spouses are welcome to attend, and. You can register online at the district website. Okay, James. We uh, the other thing that I did want to mention is the Memorial Day parade. We will have a Memorial Day again this year, and we always participate in the parade. Uh, last year, <laughs> huh? Yeah, we always put the. Yeah, it's in there. Oh, oh, I'm just I was just going to scroll through. Yeah. Okay. 
So uh, last year, uh, this was our, we, now we normally have a float. Last year was the first year we did not have a float. Uh, this is Ron Strobel's uh, uh, truck and uh, some of our scholarship winners uh, are there. But uh, the, purpose of, uh, the purpose of this is to, is to see who wants to participate this year on the Memorial Day Parade Committee. And, and oh, there's Greg. Ah, there's, uh, OK, Bill Woldridge, City Council. And, uh, and Dave Basil, Mayor Dave Basil. And uh, Dan Williams, Rotarians and, and all members of the City Council. So um, uh, if, you, if you would like to participate in the Memorial Day Parade, like to be on the committee, like to help build a float, come and see me at some point in time. So that's, uh, that's that. The next thing that we can do is to uh, have our Rota Buck drawing while we're, waiting for, uh, while we're waiting for the judges to come back. So. Okay, the uh, winning numbers for today, three, one, one, three. And the, it's payout is $12, and the jackpot is 200, 212. Oh, it's Craig, okay. It's, it's not... <laughs> Craig said this is the reason he comes to Rotary. <laughs> That's right. Pardon. No, I need some tickets. All right. Well. Okay. Yeah. No. No. Or I might just right. say one thing. That's, that's customary. When I am fortunate to uh, receive this about once or twice a year, it will go to the Hudson uh, Rotary Foundation. So uh, my contribution to it. So where's our treasurer at? Uh, Catherine is yes. uh, undergoing okay, dental well, surgery this morning. I'll make sure she gets a good treat. <laughs> hey, Joe. Joe, I'd like to make a recommendation of the club. Yes, Phil. Uh, we're on. Yes. I think we should build a fence between us and the clock tower club. <laughs> make them pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, they're welcome. They're welcome to come and bre to have breakfast with us anytime, anytime. Uh, while we're waiting, um, I've uh, run out of things to talk about, <laughs> and I don't sing or dance. <laughs> so, so we'll take a break and enjoy. Have some. Have, now the gala is coming along fine. Last week you did receive your packets at our meeting here last week. The gala will be on May 13th. Everyone is welcome to attend, especially, especially teachers uh, from Western Reserve and teachers from Hudson High School and parents and, and uh, uh, are welcome to attend. It's, it's held at the Hudson Garden Inn. It is, uh, tickets are $90. You can uh, see on the website, our website will soon have the link to uh, purchase tickets, $90 a person. That includes open bar, full, full dinner. And it really is, there are some wonderful uh, Wonderful op, uh, items to bid on, both silent items, uh, both the silent bidding and uh, live auction, which is, which is kind of fun. So that's May 13th at the Hilton Garden in, in Twinsburg. So, okay, we'll take a break. Um, thanks for reminding me. So as long as we have a couple seconds, uh, reminder: the Hudson Relay for Life will be taking place in June, and uh, I will bring paper forms next week to sign up. We want to get everyone to sign up if we can. Uh, no donation required to sign up. However, uh, obviously, all the money goes 100% of the proceeds go to American Cancer Society, which is, you know, in, as charities go, that's an incredibly efficient charity in terms of the money going towards cancer research, treatment, education. 
And so if you go online, you can see you just click on sign up or donate. And you go on sign up, you, you pick the Hudson Rotary team if that's what you want to select, and you're off to the races. Uh, if you want to form, if you're a uh, house of worship or other organization or uh, Clock Tower Rotary or Reserve or Hudson would like to, uh, Hudson High School would like to create a team, it's really easy. You just click on sign up and, you, and there's a little set of screens that signs up a team and uh, it's a really neat event. It'll, it'll be a 10 hour event. Uh, it used to be 24 hours, we're doing it 10 hours. It's at Lavelli Field, which um, actually is a lot more flexibility when we had at the stadium they really didn't like you putting stakes in the middle of the, the turf field so uh, so anyway and that's on uh, june 11th uh we would have loved to have it earlier but if you try and schedule something in hudson you have to not do it memorial day ice cream social <laughs> graduation and so on and on and on so that was actually the day that was open so a uh, little later that we would like it closer into uh school time but uh that's what we had so anyway just that little commercial on that oh and then also uh we're gonna we are for the hudson rotary is gonna have a raffle basket uh, where we just we did this last year incredibly successful wine always works <laughs> if you can look, look in your cabinets get that bottle of wine that's just been sitting there white or red or whatever uh, and if you could bring it in uh, we'll put it in the basket last year we had like I don't know 30 bottles of wine and it was uh, it was a, it was probably the number one uh, uh, item in terms of auction you know fundraising there last year because uh, people really liked the idea of getting this huge basket of wine. So, um, yeah, bring those in. We'll, we'll collect those and we'll have those for the relay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Joe? I'd just like to say something. Um, every once in a while we, we kind of forget we have people speaking up, up front and I think we owe it to ourselves to take our conversations out, outdoors and while we're having a meeting, at least Show some respect for the people who are speaking to us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Okay. So I, I would like to uh, just uh, acknowledge some of the people that helped uh, put on our program today. James Field, who uh, mans our uh, video. Thanks, James. And James, we did not have a service learning student help us today. So James had to uh, do the whole thing. Gail, thanks for being a greeter this morning and uh, our audio and the visual setup and teardown crew. Uh, Tom Page was here, James Field, John Hairston, and Ron Barnhouse. Uh, there's a, a board meeting, uh, Hudson Rotary board meeting in the Greenwood private dining room today following our meeting, and all Rotarians are welcome to attend. So, so we will uh, just wait for the results of our judging committee.
four of the contestants to come on up front. And while they're doing that, um, Matt Peterson, if you would stand, and Brian Carr, if you would please stand. After we're done, we're gonna, we're gonna have a, a team photo here, and I'd like you to come up. But I wanna give everybody a round of applause for our support at the high school and the academy. <laughs> now this is the, hard, the fun part, but the hard part. And, and I heard several comments out there, I'm glad I'm not a judge, uh, for, good, for good reason. I uh, want to thank everybody for the, for the great job preparation and what you've done. Uh, scoring is, as you can imagine, close. But we tried to, we, the, the judges did a nice job and there was some slim things, but there was some differences uh, all across from first, second, third, or fourth. So, um, in fourth place, again close, Maria Zhao. Third place, even closer, Paul Schumacher. Oh. And just a reminder, the the um, the winner four hundred dollars, three hundred dollars, two hundred dollars, and one hundred dollars for the four four places. Four places. Um, second place, Jan Kang. And I guess. 
Kate, third time's a chart. She's been here three years and second place for three years. So congratulations. Give them all a big hand. So thank you, Jim and Ted, for running that. Um, and this concludes our meeting. Thank you.